My topic tonight is Revelation describes the United States in Bible prophecy. Let's go back to the year 1776. The place is Philadelphia. America is deadlocked in a debate whether or not to declare independence from England. The specific day is July the 2nd, 1776. The debate wages all night. And as it comes to a vote, the vote is deadlocked. Now the vote for independence is deadlocked for one specific reason. There are three delegates from Delaware. One, wrote, one votes for independence from England, the other votes to stay with England, and the other is not there. He's home on his farm, and there's a terrible rainstorm, the roads are muddy, and he hasn't come. So the vote is deadlocked. Both of the delegates from Delaware have split their vote. The rest of the Continental Congress has split its vote. Word like wildfire crosses through the American cities, blazes across the plains, and finally gets to this man in Delaware. The one man whose vote can make a difference. He gets on his horse, rides in the rain, in the mud, all night, and arrives at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia early in the morning. Now there was a little boy, the story tells, that had a grandfather, and when this delegate from Delaware arose, the little boy, his grandfather told him, you watch what happens, as legend says it. When he rug goes through the door, he'll close it behind him. It'll be locked because it's a secret vote. But you look through the keyhole. And this grandfather was a bell ringer. And he said, if they sign it, then call out to me and I'll ring for liberty. But the little boy kept looking through the people, looking through the people, looking through the people. Are they going to sign it? Are they going to sign it? Time went on. And finally, the old man got tired. He said, they're not going to sign it. They're not going to sign it. They're not going to sign it. They won't sign it. The kid keeps looking through the peephole, looking through the keyhole, and watches as the delegate casts his vote, and they sign the document for freedom. And he looks up at his grandpa, up in the belfry, and he says, Grandpa, ring, Grandpa, ring for liberty. Ring for liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America... And our Constitution guarantees liberty and freedom. Liberty and freedom are two of the great bulwarks of the United States Constitution. The Liberty Bell speaks of freedom. But there's a question. Will these historic freedoms ever be challenged? Will America ever have a union of church and state Will some of those religious freedoms that we take for granted ever be undermined? Does the Bible talk about a beast power, a religious power, that will unite church and state in America? And if that is so, does the Bible warn us? Does it reveal the future? And if it does reveal the future, what future does it reveal? Does the Bible mention the United States in prophecy? Now, it would be a very strange thing indeed if the Bible did not mention the United States in prophecy. The Bible does not describe every single nation that ever rises because the Bible is not predominantly a history book. It's a book that reveals God's plans. It's a book that reveals events that affect God's people. The reason God brought Babylon, the great nation, into the prophecies of Daniel and it is alluded to in Revelation, the reason God brought Babylon into the prophecies of Daniel is because the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar would attack and overthrow Israel or Jerusalem. Babylon was an oppressor of God's people. The reason why God brought Medo-Persia into history is because Medo-Persia would attack Babylon and be a deliverer of God's people. Why did God bring Rome into history? because a pagan Roman emperor passed a decree that all male children be killed under two years old. It affected Jesus' life. It was a, it was a Roman emperor 
that tried Jesus, Roman governor that tried Jesus, Roman soldiers nailed Christ to the cross. Follow me closely. Nations are brought into the sweep of prophecy, not merely because they are political nations. They're brought into the sweep of prophecy because they have a dramatic effect on God's people. Wouldn't it be surprising if God did not bring the United States into Bible prophecy? Because it has had such a historic role in religious freedom in our world. The book of Revelation describes the rise of America in quite graphic, detailed terms. Revelation 13, verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast. Now, if the Bible says, then I saw another beast, you'd expect a first beast to come up before it, wouldn't you? And we studied about the first beast in Revelation chapter 13. That beast that came up out of the sea. That beast with seven heads and ten horns. That beast that the dragon, or pagan Rome, gave him its seat of government. That beast that was a, or a power that was a worldwide religious system. That beast whose priests said they could forgive sins that beast that declared its leader to be equal with God or have the authority of God on earth with the number 666. We studied that first beast and we pointed out it was a Roman power that the Roman government gave to the Roman church its authority. So the Bible says in Revelation 13 verse 11 that after the demise, the deadly wound of the first beast, that I saw another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. And he had two horns like a what? lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now let's review what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy. Read it together with me please, Daniel 7 verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So the fourth beast is a fourth what? Kingdom. And you remember, we read about these four beasts in Daniel. Babylon, the lion with eagle's wings. Meet of Persia, the bear with three ribs in its mouth. We read that in these studies weeks ago in Daniel. The leopard with four heads and the wings, Greece, the dragon, pagan Rome. So in the Bible, a beast represents a king or a kingdom. It can be a political power or a religio-political power. Now, the beast in Revelation 13, in verse 1, came up out of the sea. Now, in the Bible, what does the sea represent? Well, let's read it. Revelation 17, verse 15. The sea or waters, reading together. The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the water represents what, everybody? Peoples. So the first beast came up out of the sea. In fact, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and Papal Rome all arose in the populated areas of Europe. They arose, or the populated areas of Europe, the Middle East, or Asia. Babylon came out, of course, of modern-day Iraq, in Medo-Persia, uh, in the area of Turkey, and uh, the Greece Empire. So these beasts came out of populated areas. They came up out of the sea. Babylon arose as it defeated another empire. Medo-Persia defeated Babylon, another empire. Greece defeated Medo-Persia. So the sea represents a populated area. Beast represents a king or a kingdom. Now there are some questions that we need to answer about this new beast, this other beast that comes up in the last part of Revelation chapter 13. Here are three questions we need to answer. The first is, where does this new power arise? Where does this new power arise? The first beasts arise out of the sea, but Revelation 13, 11 says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. So the first beasts arise out of the what? Sea. This is a new beast, and it arises out of the what? Earth. A beast represents a political power or a kingdom. The first kingdoms rose up in populated areas, and if the sea represents a populated area, the earth must represent a what? Unpopulated area. The earth, a barren area. So this new beast or this new power comes up out of the earth or an unpopulated area. So if we're trying to identify the second beast 
in Revelation chapter 13, the beast that rises to power after the papacy. Now notice the straight line of prophecy. Babylon rules from 605 to 539 B.C. That's the lion with leopard's wing. Medo-Persia then rules from 539 B.C. to 331. That is the, well, the first, Babylon is the lion with eagle's wings. Then the next, Medo-Persia, the bear with three ribs. Then from 331 to 169, Greece, the lion. From 169 to 351, the dragon-like beast. Then the Roman Empire falls apart from 351 to 476 A.D. 538, the papacy rises, reigns for 1260 years. But then after the papacy receives that deadly wound in 1798, there is another power that's coming up in an unpopulated area. So this new beast comes up in an unpopulated area. When does this new power arise? Well, let's look at it from the Bible. When does it arise? What does the Bible say? Revelation 13, verse 10, talks about the first beast, the papacy, and it says, he who leads into captivity shall do what, everybody? Go into captivity. Did the papal power go into captivity? Exactly. 1798, Napoleon looked to the south, was threatened by the Pope of Rome, sent his general Berthier down. It's a clear fact of history. And Berthier takes the Pope captive, and the Pope dies in 1798 in captivity. Now, you recall that the Bible says that the reign of the papal power would be for 1260 years, then it would have a deadly wound, then the deadly wound would be healed. In 538 AD, after the breakup of the Roman Empire, Justinian, the pagan Roman Empire, pagan Roman emperor, gave civil and religious authority to the Pope of Rome. That authority began in 538 AD when the last of the tribes that rose up against the papacy were destroyed. That authority would last as we studied in our last presentation for 1260 years. So from 538, 1260 years takes you to 1798. So in 1798, the Pope of Rome was taken captive, but at the same time he was going into captivity, a new power would rise in an unpopulated area of the earth. Then how would this power arise? Where would it rise? In, in an unpopulated area. When would it rise? Sometime after the first beast went into captivity, sometime after 1798. How would this power arise? What does the Bible say? It says, then I saw another beast. Now let's go over every word. I saw another beast. What is a beast, everybody? It is a what? Kingdom or political power. Coming up out of the what? Earth. The sea represents peoples, the earth represents a what? Unpopulated area, and it had two horns like a lamb. This power that comes up in an unpopulated area after 1798, the Bible gives it two identifying characteristics. It says it has two horns like a lamb. It is a lamb-like beast. The lion, Babylon, is an old animal. The bear is old, full-grown, mature. The leopard is full-grown, mature, dragon, full-grown, mature. But this beast is like a lamb, so it's a new nation, young nation. So here's a young nation that grows up in an unpopulated area after 1798, and it says it has two what like a lamb? Back to the screen, two what? Horns like a lamb. Now, horns are symbols of power. There are no crowns on the horns of this second beast. Do you remember when we read about the first beast, the papacy? The first beast has crowns on its horns. Look, for example, at the text. Revelation 13, verse 1 said, Then I stood on the sand of the sea. So this first beast, the papacy, comes up in a populated area, the sea. It comes up in Europe. I saw a beast, a political religious power, rising up out of the sea, out of the peoples of Europe. Then it says, he had seven heads and ten horns, ten kingdoms of Europe, the basis for the papacy, and on his horns, ten crowns. So what is on the, on the horns? What's on the, on the horns? Crowns. What do crowns indicate? Crowns indicate what? Kingly authority. 
A horn is a symbol of power. A beast is a symbol of an empire. Its horn is its power. So empires have kings as their authority figures. So the empires of Europe, those ten horns, all were governed by kings. But here is a new beast that arises, a new power, after 1798, in an unpopulated area. But what, does no, what doesn't it have on its horns? What doesn't it have on its horns? What? Crowns. Because its power does not come from a king. It has two horns of power. What are they? Political and religious freedom. So it derives its power, not from a king, but its horns of power represent religious and political freedom. The lack of crowns indicates freedom. No kingly authority. A government by the people, for the people, and of the people. Horns are a symbol of power. They indicate that this second beast derives its power from political and religious freedom. Now let's summarize the principles of this lamb-like beast, this new nation that's coming up, this new nation that is emerging. First, it arises around 1798. Second, it arises in a relatively unpopulated area. Ladies and gentlemen, what nation was rising in about 1798 in an unpopulated area that had no crowns on its horns but had political and religious freedom that was a new nation like a lamb? What nation was that? There's only one, the United States of America. In fact, look what the historian says. The New World compared with the old, G.A. Townsend, page 635. So he talks about the mystery of her, America, coming forth from vacancy like a silent seed we grew into an empire. Townsend, the historian says, like a seed planted in the earth that just bursts and grows forth, we grew into an empire out of the earth. Uriah Smith, who wrote about 100 years ago, a little more, said, page 578 of his book, Commentary on Daniel and Revelation, said, emerging amid the silence of the earth, adding daily power to its, adding daily to its power and strength. So this beast that arises, a power after 1798, unpopulated area. Historians talk about America growing out of the bowels of the earth, America coming up. It would, according to the Bible, be a young nation like a lamb. America certainly is, the United States. It would have no crowned head, no kingly authority. America certainly does not. It would rise to a position of worldwide power and influence based on political and religious freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, what nation is described here? It is very obvious when you look clearly at the nation that indeed is described in this particular passage. It's very clear that this nation is the United States of America. The only nation that fits this description is the United States of America. I thank God for a nation that is carved out by prophecy. I thank God for every democratic loving nation. The United States, certainly Canada, Australia, the great nations in Europe today that are champions of freedom, champions of democracy, champions of political and religious freedom. The Bible describes the rise of the United States. And as the Bible describes the rise of the United States, it describes it as being a champion of religious and political freedom. It describes it as being a champion of holding that torch high. When you go to the New York Harbor and you see the Statue of Liberty, and it says, give me your tired masses huddling to breathe free air. You say, this indeed is the torch of freedom. Would to God that the bell of religious liberty would always ring. Would to God that America would always be the land of the free and the home of the brave. Would to God that these religious freedoms would always be maintained in the United States 
of America. But what does the Bible predict? Revelation 13, verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke. Spoke like a what? Dragon. The beast that comes up after 1798. The beast that comes up in this unpopulated area. The beast that comes up with two horns like a lamb, political and religious freedom. He would ultimately speak like a what? Dragon. Does the Bible actually predict that the wall of church and state would be eroded in America? Does the Bible actually predict that America one day would lose its rich heritage of religious freedom? What does the future hold for America, this great country of ours? What does the future hold for a world with multiple nations in freedom? Could it be that there is a rise of a beast power, a fallen religious system that unites with other religious powers and systems, that ultimately unites with state powers, and ultimately religious freedom is taken away? How does the Bible describe that religious oppression occurring, or does it? Let's go on. The Bible says, Revelation 13, verse 12, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Now, that's the second beast, has the authority of the first beast. The first beast, the leopard-like beast, the beast that the dragon, pagan Rome, gives its seat of government is the papacy. The second beast, it says, America and freedom-loving nations unite with the papacy. Causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. So there is a church-state union, a political-religious alliance of worship. The Bible goes on, whose deadly wound was healed. So the deadly wound of the first beast, the papacy was healed. Papacy reaches out to Protestantism. Protestantism and the papacy have not united denominations, but united purposes, common goals. They link arms, according to the prophecy. Fallen religion unites all together under one head, and they appeal to the state powers. Notice what the Bible says. What leads to this union? Revelation 13, verse 13. He, the Antichrist power, working under the auspices of Satan, says, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in sight of men. So there's marvelous wonders, spectacular miracles, but there are false miracles that are occurring. Somebody says, what does it mean that fire comes down from God out of heaven? In the Bible, what is fire a symbol of? Well, you remember when Israel wandered in the wilderness? God led them by a pillar of fire by night, represented the presence of God. He was guiding them. Remember in the sanctuary, in the Old Testament, two angels of gold, between those two angels of gold, those two cherubim above the mercy seat, there was the Shekinah glory, the fire, the presence of God. What about the fire that came down and consumed the altar in the days of Elijah? That represented what? The presence of God. God. What about tongues of fire that fell in Acts chapter 2 that came down from heaven? The presence of God through the Holy Ghost. So fire is a symbol of the presence of God. But here, this is false fire that comes down. The false presence of God. A false religious revival. A, re a religious revival that leads to a union of church-state powers. Revelation 13, verse 14 says, He deceives those who dwell on earth by those signs or miracles which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Then what happens? It's telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So the Bible says that religions unite not denominations becoming the, uh, the same as the other denomination, not two denominations dropping their denominational identity, but uniting on points that they can have in common. This union of religions puts pressure on legislators. This union of religions says, look at the power that's working through us. Look at all of these miracles, and they make an image to the beast. Now, what is an image? 
What is an image? What if I said, you are the spitting image of your mother? You are the spitting image of your father. Do you ever know that expression? Do you know it? How many know that expression, the spitting image? Sure. What does it mean, the spitting image? You are a what? You look just like your mother, right? You look just like your father. Spitting image simply is a colloquial, kind of crude expression that means you are a likeness of. An image is a likeness of. So there is a likeness in America of what happened in ancient Europe. A likeness in the sense that church and state unite to form and to create oppressive decrees. The Bible predicts the church and state will unite in America, and in the, not only in America, but in the free world, and ultimately, before Christ comes a second time, that freedoms will erode, and that with this great conglomerate, this great union of false religion and state powers, that God's people will face oppression. Does the Bible give any indication of the end time events in light of this union. In other words, what leads up to this? What leads up to historic freedoms in America and in the free speaking world being eroded? Does this just happen with a snap of the finger? Thinking people will challenge any move by government and the government of America, and I praise God for that, and I thank God for every lover of freedom every political leader that loves freedom. But ladies and gentlemen, what is going to condition the mind? What events, according to Revelation, are going to lead up to an erosion of freedom and the creation of a religious conglomerate that puts pressure on the state that erodes freedom? Does Revelation give us any indication? It does. Revelation, the 18th chapter, gives us five things that lead up to this Union. Number one, it talks about the world just before the coming of Jesus, and it says, read it together with me, please. Her sins have reached to heaven. Revelation 18, verse 5. Now look, the devil is not ignorant. Here you have a society that's in moral decline, a society of pornography, a society of immorality, a society of violence, a society that morally is falling apart, a society whose sins have reached to heaven. What happened when Sodom and Gomorrah's sins reached to heaven? Fire came down. They were destroyed. What happened when the society in Noah's day, the sins reached to heaven? It was destroyed by water. So here's a society that sins have reached to heaven. What happens? Religious leaders begin to arise, and they say, we need to get back to God. We need to pass religious legislation. We need to change the free, there's too much freedom because look what freedom is doing. We need to bring America back to God. It sounds good. But what's the flip side of that legislation for those that may not go along with that form of legislated religion? Notice the second thing Revelation 18 says. It says she or this society has lived luxuriously. Here is a time of wealth, a time when the stock market is going off the chart. But that prepares for something else. Notice number three. Revelation 18.8 says that at this time, when sins are reaching to heaven, at this time of luxury, there would be natural disasters. Read Revelation 18. There'd be natural disasters. Earthquake, cyclone, hurricane, tidal waves, now put these things together. Sins reaching to heaven, moral toboggan slide. Living luxuriously. Wealth. But then natural disasters, and then what happens? Look at number four. God's judgments begin to fall. Revelation 18, verse 10. And in number five, the riches that they base their society on, you read it, Revelation 18, 17, the riches come to what? Nothing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. If America, or the free world, went through an economic collapse, if it did, let's just say perhaps, if it did, and if there were numerous natural disasters, 
And if religious leaders arose and said, these are the judgments of God in the land, what we need to do is pass religious legislation to bring men and women back to God. Would it sound good and plausible? particularly if in those religious organizations there were mighty miracles and the sick were being healed. Would not the normal person say, this is the mighty work of God, it's the only hope for our nation, let us pass that religious legislation. A spiritual decline, natural disasters, social chaos and economic difficulties lead up to a church-state union. And what does Satan do? Satan takes advantage of the situation by introducing a false spiritual revival. Look at how the Bible describes it. Here it is. Revelation 13, verse 13. He, the Antichrist, the satanic powers, perform great signs so that he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he's granted to do in the sight of the beast. There's praise, there's worship, thousands gather. They say the only hope for America is to bring it back to God. And we can do that as church, as, as, the, as the church influences the state for morality and laws will be passed to legislate morality to safeguard our society and as evidence that God is with us. Look at the miracles that God is working. But the Bible says, Revelation 16, verse 14, they are the spirits of what, everybody? Demons performing what? Signs or miracles. What are they going to do? Which go out to the what? Kings of the earth. Who are the kings of the earth? The political leaders. And it says, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So at a time when society appears to be falling apart, Religious leaders will appeal to secular civil government to get them to sign legislation to make society Christian. You say, how can I tell the difference between a true and false revival? How can I tell a difference? There are some ways you can tell, ladies and gentlemen. Here's one of them. Notice what the Bible says. Jesus said it, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute. These people are calling out the name of Jesus. But Jesus says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, where? In heaven. So it's not crying out, Lord, Lord, in a false religious revival. But you say, look, they cast out demons. Look, they perform miracles. Look, they even have prophecies. Well, watch this. Many will say, what's the first word? What is it? Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Do they prophesy in Jesus' name? Do they? Yes, notice what it goes on to say. We've cast out demons in your name. Do they cast out demons in Jesus' name? We've done many wonders or miracles in your name. They do three things in his name. They first prophesy in his name. They cast out demons in his name. They work miracles in his name. But what does he say? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. He never knew them? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He never knew them? When they were casting demons out in his name, he never knew them? When they were working miracles in his name, he never knew them? When they were prophesying in his name, he never knew them? Why? Because the devil can counterfeit miracles. It's not crying, Lord, Lord, but it's on your knees repenting of sin and letting Christ change your life. And any so-called religious revival that leads to what is the last word? You who practice what? Lawlessness. And what is lawlessness? It's turning your back on God's law. It's rebelling against God's law. So there will be a mighty false revival that takes in millions. Citizens will be concerned about the decline of morality. They'll be concerned about a society that's falling up. Natural disasters will come. Economic bottom will drop out. These churches in union will receive what they claim to be is fire from heaven by the Holy Spirit. They will claim miracles. 
They'll claim prophecy. They'll claim casting out demons. And they'll say the next step in all of this is if we only could pass religious legislation, we could get back to God. But the Bible is very plain, and it says, read it with me please, Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they do not speak according to God's law, no matter how many miracles they worked, there is no light in them because they can be false miracles if they do not speak according to God's law. See, many have turned from God's law and they want to enforce religious laws. The Bible says, to the law and to the testimony of Scripture, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is how much light? How much light? No light. It doesn't say there is no power because the devil can give false power. It doesn't say there's no truth because the devil mixes truth and error. It doesn't say there's no love because sometimes you'll find a church or religious organization that apparently has love, apparently has some power, it apparently has some truth, but the Bible says there is no, what everybody? Light, and light is what you follow. Light illuminates the darkness. Light says go this way. And if they are not teaching in harmony with God's law, it is a false religious revival, ladies and gentlemen, and not the power of God. But wait a minute, that leads us to a question. If the devil wanted to unite people religiously, what vehicle might he use? How would the devil ever unite people religiously? How might he do that? Well, maybe, just maybe, the devil would use the same vehicle that he used in early Christianity. What vehicle did the devil use in early Christianity in the days of Rome when the Roman Empire was falling apart to unite the nation? You remember what it was, don't you? Rome was falling apart. The ancient pagans were worshipping what? The sun god. And so the Roman Empire united with the Roman Church under the auspices of Sunday to unite or bring that empire together. The Roman Church and the Roman government met. Now let's look at the book, the two, the two Babylons, by Dr. Alexander Hislop, page 105. It says, to conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity. What does that mean, to conciliate? That means kind of to bring them together. To conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measure to get the Christian and pagan festivals, that's the Christian Sunday and the Pagan Sunday, amalgamated. That's a big word. It means united. United is what it means. And again, paganism and Christianity, now far sunk in idolatry, in this as in so many other things, to do what? Read it with me. To do what? Shake hands. So, in the early centuries, when the Roman government was falling apart, to get the empire united, you needed a vehicle. Everybody wouldn't necessarily believe the same thing, but you needed a vehicle. You needed something to bring people together. And that became Sunday. I wonder, is it possible, is it possible that at a time of economic decline, a time when the sins of America are reaching to heaven, a time of false revival and miracles, a time of rising crime and violence, that religious leaders could arise and say, drop our denominational differences. Oh, sure, here's your denomination, here's mine, but we all worship the same God. Why don't we, as a symbol of our unity, pass legislation in America for a common day of rest and worship, and even if you are a non-Christian, use it as a recreation day for your family. Let this be that vehicle, that day, that sets America aside. America, somebody says, is in deep trouble. Do you see, ladies and gentlemen, how appealing and how attractive this could be? Particularly if the call came from religious leaders, particularly if legislation were pushed by churches to have this kind of common day, you say, but wait a minute, there is a great wall of church and state. This could never happen in America. 
in recent years, some fascinating things have happened with this wall of church and state. Here's Chief Justice William Rehnquist. He says, the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. He is a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The St. Louis Dispatch was concerned about and reported on some decisions made by the Supreme Court. 1991, October 29, St. Louis Post-Dispatch said, the article, as the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, that's the 1990s, the Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. So as the 1990s were coming to a close, the Supreme Court was doing something. What does the St. Louis Dispatch say that they were doing? Help me, what were they doing? Redefining, what were they redefining? The Supreme Court of America. Religious liberty and what it would mean. What's the difference? The court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. It helps the conventional religions, but it hurts the unconventional. In other words, it helps the majority. It hurts the minority. What if a majority of Americans wanted to pass a law that all of us should meet together on the first day of the week? What if the majority of Americans went to their legislators at a time of rising crime and said, we have to bring America back to God? What if a group of these religious leaders said the reason why we're having famines, earthquakes, problems in America, the reason the economic bottom dropped out is because we drifted away from God and we need a nation under God again and Sunday is that vehicle? Could it ever happen in America at a time of crisis? Somebody says, I'm not so sure whether it could. The Supreme Court recently argued that some forms of Sunday laws were constitutional. One man argued against that just recently. His name was Justice William O. Douglas, and he wrote a dissent for the Supreme Court. And here's what he said. It seems to be plain that by these laws, that's Sunday laws, the states, you know, there are many Sunday laws still on the books. The states compel one, that is any person, under the sanction of law to refrain from work or recreation on Sunday because of the what? Majority's views on that day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this history is not 50 years old. This history is not 100 years old. This is not 200 years old. This is Justice William O. Douglas, and he's saying that the issue is whether the majority in a free society has the right to pass laws in opposition that would affect the minority. Then he goes on to say, the state by law makes Sunday a symbol of respect or adherence. And he says, that's why I could never vote for a Sunday law. Ladies and gentlemen, a church and state union occurring just before the end. You say, but religious leaders would stand up in opposition. Would they? Would they? Christianity Today, Harold Linzall was the editor. Christianity Today is probably one of the major magazines of the Christian church. I read it. I'm blessed by many of its articles. May 7, 1976. Now, who can remember, folk? Who can remember May 7, 1976? Can you remember May 7, 19... That's a long time ago, isn't it? Does anybody know what was going on 1976? What kind of crisis America was facing? Gasoline crisis, wasn't it? You remember those long pumps and those long lines? Now, this was a little crisis. It wasn't a huge one. Back to the screen. Okay. Harold Linzall, editor of Christianity Today, said, hey, we can, we can solve the problem. All businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday. Then he says, by force of legislative fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. He said, look, why don't we just pass laws? For those that go to church on Sunday, wonderful. For those that want it as a social day, wonderful. But if we've got a gas crisis, let's solve it. But let me ask you, what if the crisis were 100 times worse than a gas crisis? Perhaps America might go the very way that prophecy 
indicates in Revelation chapter 13, it says he would tell those who dwell on the earth to make an image, a likeness to the beast, a likeness to papal Rome, union of church and state. The papal Rome is wounded by the sword. It now lives. There's a union of that power. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. A union of church and state. No man buying or selling. The beast power ultimately arising. A great human confederacy, a religio-political union. Sunday, a vehicle. You say, could never happen. Well, here's a book by Pat Robertson, The New World Order. And many know that Pastor Robinson ran, Robertson ran for president on one occasion. Powerful movement in the moral majority. Christians to influence legislators. I was interested. I've read most of his book, The New World Order. And it came to a chapter, and this chapter fascinated me. It's page 236. And Pat Robertson, New World Order, said this. The next obligation that a citizen of God's world order, and he's talking about we need to establish a world order for God. We need God's world order. The problem is crime. The problem is rising violence. The problem is immorality. The problem is pornography. The problem is we need a God's world order. If we have that, it'll solve all our problems. Now let's go back. This is what he says. The next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now he's speaking of Sunday here. Is a command for personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Now, it sounds good, doesn't it? Then he says, laws in America that mandated a day of rest, that is, Sunday laws, that is, a prominent religious leader today, that mandated a day of rest, have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state. He goes on, points out, this is an outright insult to God and his plan. Now, I don't know if you got that or not. He said, when the Sunday laws are taken off the books, this is an insult to God and his plan. Because God's plan is to have a legislated morality through Sunday laws. Only those policies can be shown to have clearly secular purpose or recognized. Now, here's what he's arguing. He's saying America's become a secular nation. And because it's a secular nation, its government policies are secular. He says, we have to change that. In God's new world order, we have to have a religious basis, and the, the Sunday laws would provide that religious basis if you call the nation back to God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the fallacy in that thinking is this. Every time church and state united in the past, there has been persecution of the minorities. Ladies and gentlemen, the fallacy in that thinking is this. You cannot legislate by law morality. God is calling for a revival in America, but the Bible tells us how that revival is to be achieved by God. Notice what the Bible says. Here is God's call to America. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is God's call for repentance. It is not a call to put pressure on legislators to legislate one day of the week as holy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a call to be on your knees. This is a call with your face in the dirt. This is a call to give up lust and give up pornography and give up immorality. This is a call to give up selfishness and give up greed. This is a call to repent of sin. This is a call to open your hearts to God. This is God's personal call. Would you agree with me tonight that every time society tries to legislate religion and pass laws, that it undermines our freedom, that God's call is not that his law be legislated from above, but it, his law is written in our mind, it's written in our hearts, and we keep him be, that law because we love him. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, God is not leading us as a society 
to legislate the observance of one day. He is leading us personally as a society, deep within our hearts to repent of our sins and love Jesus so much that we keep his seventh day Sabbath because it is enshrined in our hearts, not because Sunday is mandated by government. God himself is appealing to us personally. God himself is appealing to us individually, not for some legislation. Jesus Christ said, if. Jesus said, if you, what? Love me, do what? Keep my commandments. When we fall in love with Jesus Christ, we love him so much that we want to obey him. Ladies and gentlemen, two movements. The movement on this hand sees the problems in society. The movement on this hand sees the problems in society. The movement on this hand says the way to solve those problems is gather everybody together under one common day of worship, putting pressure on legislators with a legislated morality. The movement on this hand says, look at all these miracles. Sabbath, that doesn't make any difference. Whether you have images in the church, that doesn't make any difference. Let's all unite on the so-called Christ. And let's all unite on a common day of worship. And that'll solve the problems of society. Church, state, unite to legislated morality. But there is another movement of the Spirit on this hand, a genuine movement that's rocking the world. That movement of the Spirit says, God's call for the hour is to open your heart to Christ. God's call for the hour is to be on your knees seeking God. God's call for the hour is to let him write that law in your mind so you know it. Write that law in your heart so you love it. God's call for the hour is to step out of the majority, step out of the popular way, and say, for me, it's the Bible only. For me, it's Christ alone. For me, I love God enough to worship the Creator on the seventh day of the week, the Bible Sabbath, even if I need to step out. Ladies and gentlemen, in ancient Rome, the Apostle Paul preached in Nero, in Nero's, the government of Rome, the Apostle Paul's writings influenced all of Rome. Paul's witness influenced Rome. And a number in the universities, a number in the army, a number in the navy, a number of shopkeepers and artisans and merchants accepted Christ. As they did, as they did, there was one Roman guard, 40 soldiers, 40 wrestlers in that Roman guard. And they said, we are committing our life totally to Christ. We will no longer burn incense to the Roman governor. No longer burn incense to the heads of Rome. These 40 elite Roman guards who had accepted Jesus Christ and made a decision to step out alone for him. History tells us were taken to northern Italy. And they were brought out on a pond. It was cold. The wind was howling. The pond was frozen over, thick with ice. And they were put in the center of the pond. And they said, if you come off here, we're going to kill you. Roman garrisons surrounded the pond. They said, the only reason you can leave that pond is if you're willing to offer incense to Caesar. They lit bonfires on the shore. And the soldiers drank and partied on the shore. And they drank warm soup. Had gour gourmet meals. Those 40 men, former Roman soldiers, began to sing, We are 40 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. To thine be the glory. To thine be the praise. To thine be the honor. Forever and ever, we are 40 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. The night went on. The night was cold. 
And as it was, they were shivering. We are 40 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. One of the men couldn't take it any longer. And he began to stagger from that group of 40 over to the shore, and he began to shout out, I, I will offer incense to Caesar. The group was silent for a moment, but then they took up the chant, 39 wrestlers for thee, O Christ, to thine be the honor, to thine be the glory, to thine be the praise, 39 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. The captain of the Roman guard on shore threw down his helmet, threw off his cloak, gallantly strode out into the center of the pond, said, I too will accept this Christ. And again the chant went up, Forty wrestlers for thee, O Christ, to thine be the glory, to thine be the honor. In the last days of verse history, God will have wrestlers for Christ. God will have men and women in his army. Revelation 14, verse 12, where are they? Here is the patience of the saints. This is no legislated morality. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is a righteous minority. Here is the chosen few. Here are God's people, men and women who say, Christ, we love you, we're saved by faith, and we want to keep your law obediently. With all of my heart, I say, Lord, I want my heart to be your temple. With all of my heart, I say, Lord, I want my heart to absorb the grace of God. With all of my heart, I say, Lord, I want to obey you and keep your Sabbath. With all of my heart, I say, Lord, I want my body to be your temple. With all my heart, I want to see Jesus come again. And Sandy comes and sings. Would you like to say tonight, Lord, with all my heart, I want to worship and serve you. Why not bow your head right now and say, Lord, with all my heart, I want to serve you. In this quiet place with you, I bow before your throne. I bear the deepest part of me to you and you alone. I keep no secrets, for there is no thought you have not known. I bring my best and all the rest to you.
tonight deep within your heart. Would you like to say, Lord, I want to serve you with all my heart. Lord, I'm not interested in the razzle and the dazzle. Not interested in so-called spectacular wonders. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, God will have a movement. There will be miracles worked. But God is not leading us to miracles at the expense of His Word. God is not leading us to miracles at the expense of His law. Not as God is not leading us to miracles to give some kind of credence to put pressure on legislators to pass a common law for a common day of worship. God is leading us in our hearts to serve Him. God is leading us to fall on our face in repentance. God is leading us to cry out to Him to give us new hearts. What we need is not laws in society. We need Christ's law in our hearts to change us. That's what we need. Not some legislated morality by politicians. We need more than politicians to legislate morality. We need Christ to change us from within. Would you like to say tonight, Lord, I want you to do that. Change me inside as we pray. Oh, Father, we need Christ. Change us with inside. Make us the kind of people we ought to be. Oh, Father, we long to obey you and serve you and live for you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. My topic tonight is Revelation describes the United States in Bible prophecy. Let's go back to the year 1776. The place is Philadelphia. America is deadlocked in a debate whether or not to declare independence from England. The specific day is July the 2nd, 1776. The debate wages all night. And as it comes to a vote, the vote is deadlocked. Now the vote for independence is deadlocked for one specific reason. There are three delegates from Delaware. One, wrote, one votes for independence from England, the other votes to stay with England, and the other is not there. He's home on his farm, and there's a terrible rainstorm, the roads are muddy, and he hasn't come. So the vote is deadlocked. Both of the delegates from Delaware have split their vote. The rest of the Continental Congress has split its vote. Word like wildfire crosses through the American cities, blazes across the plains, and finally gets to this man in Delaware. The one man whose vote can make a difference. He gets on his horse, rides in the rain, in the mud, all night, and arrives at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia early in the morning. Now, there was a little boy, the story tells, that had a grandfather. And when this delegate from Delaware arose, the little boy, his grandfather told him, you watch what happens, as legend says it. When he goes through the door, he'll close it behind him. It'll be locked because it's a secret vote. But you look through the keyhole. And this grandfather was a bell ringer. And he said, if this new power arise, the first beasts arise out of the sea. But Revelation 13, 11 says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. So the first beasts arise out of the what? See, this is a new beast, and it arises out of the what? Earth. A beast represents a political power or a kingdom. The first kingdoms rose up in populated areas, and if the sea represents a populated area, the earth must represent a what? 
unpopulated area, the earth, the barren area. So this new beast or this new power comes up out of the earth or an unpopulated area. So if we're trying to identify the second beast in Revelation chapter 13, the beast that rises to power after the papacy. Now notice the straight line of prophecy. Babylon rules from 605 to 539 BC. That's the lion with leopard's wing. Medo-Persia then rules from 539 BC to 331. That is the, well, the first, Babylon is the lion with eagle's wings. Then the next, Medo-Persia, the bear with three ribs. Then from 331 to 169, Greece, the from 169 to 351, the dragon-like beast. Then the Roman Empire falls apart from 351 to 476 AD. 538, the papacy rises, reigns for 1260 years. But then after the papacy receives that deadly wound in 1798, there is another power that's coming up in an unpopulated area. So this new beast comes up in an unpopulated area. When does this new power arise? Well, let's look at it from the Bible. When does it arise? What does the Bible say? Revelation 13, verse 10, talks about the first beast, the papacy, and it says, he who leads into captivity shall do what, everybody? Go into captivity. Did the papal power go into captivity? Exactly. 1798, Napoleon looked to the south, was threatened by the Pope of Rome, sent his general Berthier down. It's a clear fact of history. And Berthier takes the Pope captive, and the Pope dies and said, would attack and overthrow Israel or Jerusalem. Babylon was an oppressor of God's people. The reason why God brought Medo-Persia into history is because Medo-Persia would attack Babylon and be a deliverer of God's people. Why did God bring Rome into history? Because a pagan Roman emperor passed a decree that all male children be killed under two years old. It affected Jesus' life. It was a, ma it was a Roman emperor that tried Jesus, Roman governor that tried Jesus. Roman soldiers nailed Christ to the cross. Follow me closely. Nations are brought into the sweep of prophecy not merely because they are political nations. They're brought into the sweep of prophecy because they have a dramatic effect on God's people. Wouldn't it be surprising if God did not bring the United States into Bible prophecy? Because it has had such a historic role in religious freedom in our world. The book of Revelation describes the rise of America in quite graphic, detailed terms. Revelation 13, verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast. Now, if the Bible says, Then I saw another beast, you'd expect a first beast to come up before it, wouldn't you? And we studied about the first beast in Revelation chapter 13. That beast that came up out of the sea. That beast with seven heads and ten horns. That beast that the dragon or pagan Rome gave him its seat of government. That beast that was a, or a power that was a worldwide religious system. That beast whose priests said they could forgive sins. That beast that declared its leader to be equal with God or have the authority of God on earth with the number 666. We studied that first beast and we pointed out it was a Roman power that the Roman government gave to the Roman church its authority. So the Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 11, that after the demise, the deadly wound of the first beast, that I saw another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. And he had two horns like a what? Lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now let's review what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy. Read it together with me, please. Daniel 7, verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So the fourth beast is a fourth what? Kingdom. And you remember, we read about these four beasts in Daniel. Babylon, the lion with eagle's wings. Medo-Persia, the bear with three ribs in its mouth. We read that in these studies weeks ago in Daniel. The leopard with four heads and the wings. Greece, the dragon, pagan Rome. So in the Bible, a beast represents a king or a kingdom. It can be a political power or a religio-political power. 
Now, the beast in Revelation 13, in verse 1, came up out of the sea. Now, in the Bible, what does the sea represent? Well, let's read it. Revelation 17, verse 15, the sea or waters, reading together. The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the water represents what, everybody? Peoples. So the first beast came up out of the sea. In fact, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and Papal Rome all arose in the populated areas of Europe. They arose, or the populated areas of Europe, the Middle East, or Asia. Babylon came out, of course, of modern-day Iraq, in Medo-Persia, uh, in the area of Turkey, and uh, the Greece Empire. So these beasts came out of populated areas. They came up out of the sea. Babylon arose as it defeated another empire. Medo-Persia defeated Babylon, another empire. Greece defeated Medo-Persia. So the sea represents a populated area. Beast represents a king or a kingdom. Now there are some questions that we need to answer about this new beast, this other beast that comes up in the last part of Revelation chapter 13. Here are three questions we need to answer. The first is, where does this new power arise? Where does they sign it? Then call out to me and I'll ring for liberty. But the little boy kept looking through the people, looking through the people, looking through the people. Are they going to sign it? Are they going to sign it? Time went on. And finally, the old man got tired. He said, they're not going to sign it. They're not going to sign it. They're not going to sign it. They won't sign it. The kid keeps looking through the peephole, looking through the keyhole, and watches as the delegate casts his vote, and they sign the document for freedom. And he looks up at his grandpa, up in the belfry, and he says, Grandpa, ring, Grandpa, ring for liberty. Ring for liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America... And our Constitution guarantees liberty and freedom. Liberty and freedom are two of the great bulwarks of the United States Constitution. The Liberty Bell speaks of freedom. But there's a question. Will these historic freedoms ever be challenged? Will America ever have a union of church and state Will some of those religious freedoms that we take for granted ever be undermined? Does the Bible talk about a beast power, a religious power, that will unite church and state in America? And if that is so, does the Bible warn us? Does it reveal the future? And if it does reveal the future, what future does it reveal? Does the Bible mention the United States in prophecy? Now, it would be a very strange thing indeed if the Bible did not mention the United States in prophecy. The Bible does not describe every single nation that ever rises because the Bible is not predominantly a history book. It's a book that reveals God's plans. It's a book that reveals events that affect God's people. The reason God brought Babylon, the great nation, into the prophecies of Daniel and it is alluded to in Revelation, the reason God brought Babylon into the prophecies of Daniel is because the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar 